We're back. We're live. We're still live here on a given Tuesday at Think Tech Talks Community Matters with Jonathan Pajot. Did I say that right? Correct. Pajot, yeah. Pajot, uh, who runs Delice Crepe in Haleiwa. It's a VW bus, and it's uh, you couldn't find a Peugeot, Pajot? Uh, no Peugeot for the Peugeots here in Hawaii, but I find a <laughs> Volkswagen, the Germans, uh, more reliable in terms of cars, and I've been lucky. It's a great little van. You know, there's a story about um, <clears throat> about Europe. I'll tell you what it is. It's uh, you know, in 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 heaven, okay, all the um, the cooks uh, are what? I think they're all the cooks are um, French. All, all the police are uh, uh, the, the police are uh, wait I get this right yeah the police are German um, the the lovers are Italian uh, the mechanics are are Swiss yeah. and, and hell doesn't work quite the same way all the the police are are uh, no, I, no, I messed this up already oh, <laughs> the, the, the police are British in, in heaven uh, in hell the police are, are German um, the cooks are uh, British. That's that's terrible. <clears throat> the mechanics are French. Sorry about that. That's not that bad. And the lovers are Swiss. <laughs> Chocolate lovers. Anyway, right. we'll leave that right there. Let's go to Evan. Yeah. Okay. So um, you're, you're doing crepes in Delice crepe in Haleiwa. Um, why are you doing that? Uh, first of all, I was pursuing um, something very personal as a lifestyle. That was always kind of my goal. As a background, I had an um, environmental science uh, diploma as an engineer. From what school? Uh, back home in France, what as school? an engineer in environment. The school is called ESEP. ESEP is a kind of a fairly new engineering school about three hours west of Paris in the town called Angers. Mm -hmm. Andres. Oh, A-N-G-I-E-R-S. Correct. In the Loire Valley, isn't it? Correct, yes. along the Loire River where they have the famous wine uh, Anjou yeah. and all those yeah. different grapes. It's a wonderful there. town. It's an ancient town. Ancient town with a beautiful castle over there, Very lots of students over there, and, uh, and a great town uh, to study also and to live a little too away from the ocean for me, mm -hmm. about two hours away from the Atlantic because side. Because you were born in Brittany. Born, in, born and raised in Brittany on the coastline, uh, closer to a town called Labourne. Spell. Which is L A Z and Bull is B A U L E. Uh, it's four hours away from Paris, uh, heading west, and it's right on the coastline. It's a famous bay, supposedly one of the um, biggest and most beautiful bay of Europe. It's a 15 miles long bay, uh, sandy beach, uh, beautiful. Lots of tourism. It's got real build over there. Lots of buildings. A little bit like a Waikiki area, but a lot smaller. This is south of uh, Mont Saint Michel. South of Mont Saint Michel, a good two hours south of Mont Saint Michel, on the other tip, on the south tip of uh, of Brittany. If you look at the geography. And La Boule means the bay. La Boule means the bowl. The it's bowl, a, actual yeah, bowl. As okay. like a bowl, because back in the days they were just named by the shape or like the actual meaning of it, mm -hmm. and the shape of it is half of a bowl. So they just back in the days called it La Boule. So it was no problem for you to go from Brittany to uh, Angers to go to school. The French uh, system is uh, easy. You can attend what any, any Yeah, you don't French have school. to be like here is uh, attached to an area or like a location. You can go to any state, any department. We have departments over there instead of states here. Yeah. Um, but you can just choose the school you want. Of course, if you pass all the tests and the qualification, because there are some uh, written tests, oral tests, and following also your, your results on the previous schools. And it's free. It's not completely free. Uh, engineering schools are private in France. Uh, however, we have university system. It's kind of like a parallel way. But every kind of like science, technology science involved education is usually through private schools. But it's very minor. Like mine was uh, 3,000 euros a year. Which is more like $4,500. Correct. Yeah. Which is pretty minor here, over there in France, because everything's so free and so wonderful for that. But uh, $3,000 or $4,500 um, was already quite some money to put just to go towards education. Okay. So, uh, and what, what did you specialize in in the engineering school? I mean, was there any particular environment you said? Environment, health, and safety. Hmm. Environment, health, and safety was a three year program, and that program took me, uh, there was like 50% of that program was um, abroad in foreign countries, and I chose uh, Spain and England. So we had like um, almost six months in uh, England and about a year 
in Spain. And this is all under the auspices of the school in Angers? Yeah, all under the engineering school in Angers. So you go, you go, you go to a school in, in Spain and go to a school right. in, in Britain and that's you speak English or speak Correct. Spanish when you're in that school? Exactly. We're like continuing the same uh, courses, the same process of education with the same, um, with the same subjects but just with a different language which was quite challenging at first because yeah. it's first it's technical, it's science, it's science and all of a sudden everything's in English and at that time my English wasn't as good at all yeah. and then the year after everything was in Spanish and they speak really fast and uh, that was that was great but definitely like takes a lot of adaptation and learning curve uh, high speed on definitely the, the language part. So, and you were in school with people who who were who were speaking? I mean, who were born and raised in Britain, born yeah. and raised in Spain, who understood those languages completely, conversant in those languages. It's not like that you were with a bunch of French people in these schools. Well, we were kind of like a small group of French uh, students from that school in France being sent uh, away mm. in England and then in Spain, but we were completely. Uh, integrated into like an English school or an English yeah, okay. uh, so study school. So you had to learn the language. <clears throat> so all the classes, all our neighbors, roommates, everybody was like either uh, English, British, and English talking over there in Nottingham, uh, in the London area, or That's where Robin Hood <coughs> lived. Yeah. Robin Hood, you're correct. I can. I know you know your geography. I see that, right? Or at least you're your filmmakers. And then the other part was in uh, Spain. Was in the south of Spain. It's called Andalusia, and you were in the town of Seville. Sevilla. Oh, it's a beautiful that, town for the flamenco. That's Flamenco's. not too far from the border, is it? Where is that relative to Madrid? Uh, to Madrid, it's a six hours south. Oh, south. Oh, that's way Yeah, down. Madrid is right in the middle, kind of continental weather, yeah. a little high in the mountains almost. Yeah. And Seville is like an hour away from the Mitterrand coast, from Cadiz and Tarifa. Oh, okay. And uh, it's beautiful, very warm, gorgeous people, gorgeous music and food. And uh, everybody's alive over there from, uh, min from noon to midnight and with a very different uh, rhythm and habits in terms of meals. So in the engineering right. school, everybody did this? Not uh, well through our program and through our engineering school, yes. And that's why I chose that school with that kind of like foreign part of it. Yes, yes. Knowing that through three years of education, I will go a year and a half travel. Yes. That's kind of what to do. Yeah, me. that's great. Okay. And learning something that was attached to me through environment because I'm related very much to the nature, doing a lot of surfing, sailing, and always like spending a lot of time outside and environment seems to me uh, something better than computer science or mechanical engineer or <laughs> something more related. Were you, were you surfing uh, in Brittany? I grew up surfing. I started surfing when I was 10 years old. Uh, my father and all my family were very much and are very much into sailing, sailing boats and racing and yachting and all that. And I grew up very much um, on the beach all the time in the summertime when it's warm, of course, uh, and very, very towards the ocean all the time but it was just a little too cold, but I definitely grew up uh, surfing and sailing and using all the wetsuits and all the cold gear like we need over there in like Santa Cruz and Rio, San Francisco, that's kind of the type of weather I grew yeah. up in. Well, okay, uh, so when you, when you finished the engineering school, what degree did you get? A master as an engineer in environment, health, safety and environment. Okay, so here we are um, with that degree. What happens next? What happened next? Well, I worked in that um, in a boat factory over there back uh, in La Rochelle. It's uh, kind of next to Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. uh, That's great. in the southwest. Southwest, correct. La Rochelle, a big boat factory. It's called Fontaine Pajot Catamarans, building a giant cruising sailing catamarans for, for people that are going around the world and sailing overseas. Did you say Pajot? Correct. That's the same name. That's the same name as well. It's actually uh, my them? father's name, right? My father and a friend of his uh, back in the 70s were sailing and decided to create their own company building uh, windsurf boards and also small uh, small uh, racing boats and 10 years later they came with the idea about building cruising catamaran they were the first doing it and now today it's a 500 employees uh, company building giant catamarans worth millions of dollars and uh, they're pretty successful thanks to my father was very famous racing and sailing at that time and he's a very good friend engineer as well Mr. Fontaine was at putting all the ideas together and making it happen. Did you have any trouble getting the job? No, I was helped by my last name for sure. <laughs> but uh, I get in by doing an internship first, yeah. for a six months internship when you finish your degree over there as a master. Yeah. And then I signed up for like a year uh, working there and everything was wonderful, but I just had this uh, feeling of moving and going somewhere else. And at that time I was dating an American girl that I met through my degree while I was in Spain. 
and uh, the idea came that Hawaii could have been a, a, a start to just move away and, and live somewhere else. She was from Minnesota at that time, and it was not an option for me to go to Minnesota. <laughs> too cold. Too cold, no ocean, didn't want to die, so young. So she came one day with the idea about going to Hawaii. And no clue about Hawaii, never allowed my, uh, myself to dream about Hawaii as a surfer. And I just look at the map, Honolulu pipeline, 40 miles, 45 miles. I was like, I could almost do it every day. So from now on, I was just like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And six, six months later, we were here in Hawaii, and it's been about six years now here in Hawaii. Okay, that, that was your first trip to the U.S.? First trip to the U.S. Oh, straight to Hawaii. Straight to Hawaii. <laughs> no, I've been, I've been, sorry, I've been to the United States before uh, on the California side. Uh -huh. Uh, on the trip with my sister, was a flight attendant, uh, took me when I was 18 years old, and we went from a road trip from San Francisco all the way to um, Los Angeles. Okay. And also with my grandparents, actually, when I was 14. Oh, that sounds people. terrific, yeah. And we went to San Diego also with my grandparents yeah. to see my uncle who was selling the America's Cup over there ah, okay, in okay. San Diego in 96. Okay. You didn't want to sail the America's Cup? Um, well, I got more deep into the water instead of being on the water i decided to be in the water <laughs> okay. and playing just with the waves and the water itself instead of the wind i sail a lot and i sail a lot with my father and with just uh, with some friends and professionally also at a national level international level over there back home i sail a lot here through the waikiki Yacht club and on the boats named kazan with a scott Bradley. it's re real nice we sail every friday we sail also between islands we race all the time to Kauai. Uh, also from Maui to uh, Honolulu, it's called the Lahaina Return. Mm -hmm. So there's still some uh, sailing involved in my life a lot. Very pleasant here with the with the warm weather. It's always beautiful, right? Okay, so you you, you left uh, France. You left with certain skills in in cooking, or was that something you developed after you left France? I mean, the, first, talk about talk about crepes in Brittany. What kind of food do they have in Brittany, and what role does crepes play in Brittany? Crepes is everywhere. Out of 10 restaurants you will look around in any towns in France, I would say eight will be crepes place. It's extremely traditional, it's extremely historical, because crepes, if we look at back in the days, it was made out of uh, buckwheat flour and just a cheap kind of flour over there, back home 500 years ago. So this food was for the poor people, and they were not putting much in it. It was just water and butter, just together to feed the kids, pretty much, because it was something kind of sweet already and the kids will like it and it's it was sort of like mexican tortilla no? kind of the mexican tortilla all that is very basic food cheap food and people that are poor were eating that but without anything in it and now we make those wonderful crepes with like pesto chicken avocado tomato on the savory side or like honey chocolate whipped cream anything we want so if i go to Brittany, or is i mean to Brittany at the time you left Brittany. What, what is served in these uh, eight out of 10 restaurants in the crepes department? In the crepes department, well, the, the most uh, famous one, traditional one on the savory side will be the ham, cheese, and egg. That's kind of a very good combo. Uh, you usually leave the oak of the egg uh, in the middle and cook the white part. And it's a dry cheese and good ham and everything's really good. That goes real well uh, with the apple cider. That's what people drink over there. What kind of cheese? Uh, what kind of cheese? Usually the Gruyere, mm -hmm. call that the Gruyere, just a salted, dry cheese. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the cheddar, but a lot better, I guess, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and just more salty, more flavor out of it. And on the savory side, they always use the buckwheat. Buckwheat, it's a gluten-free flour uh, made out of uh, the, the buckwheat that's the fruit. A little, they take the seed of the fruit on the tree, and then they crunch it. And, uh, and it's just it's kind of a brown flour color and it's just very tasty, smells different. And on the sweet side, now we use the regular white flour. Uh, the batter is made out of that white flour with milk and egg. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a little better for the, the sweet part because there's not much flavor in the batter itself. So it's better with like strawberries, banana, it won't take over. And, uh, and the classic one is usually the uh, caramel. The local caramel people, they, they make their own chocolate. Everything's homemade. Wherever you go, whatever crepe place, restaurant you go, everything's homemade. It's like they all have their own specialty. There's more than any other part of France. More this than is any where other, crepes yeah. live in Brittany. Correct, correct. That's where they're from. I don't really know why just in that one area, maybe because of the, the crops back in the days, I was just growing over there more. Kind of maybe of a, 
a, f a lot of those little towns are all along the coast, and it's a lot of fishermen and sailors, and I don't know, it ended up being like just from there. And now when you go around France, mostly when you go in like big cities, or mostly Paris, I think of Paris, you see all those little corners, you, there are crepes placed everywhere. But it well, came from Brittany. But it came from Brittany. And if you go all the way to South France, you'll have a completely different taste of food, a lot more Mediterranean style with like the olive oil and all the, the salads and the tomatoes. So it's very different from the nature. If you go towards the mountain, there'll be like all, all like cheese, meat, potatoes, like more like heavy st things for the cold weather. Is, is Brittany a place where the, where the uh, British came ashore? Is, is Brittany have, I mean, I know down in uh, the southwest, uh, it was it was it was owned by Britain for a while. Uh, is Brittany another place that was owned by Britain for a while? No, it wasn't owned by Brittany for a while. And it's funny, it's kind of close, right? It's easy to mistake between a uh, British and and Brittany and and Brittany where I'm from. It's spelled a little different, and people are very different. But it's from like even before uh, countries were France or England. It's from like the Celtic, the, the Celtic attitude, the Celtic yeah. culture, mm -hmm. and also the Vikings with Normandy, Celtic, Scotland, Ireland, all that kind of coastal part of England that's facing France. All this had all those, uh, those Vikings back in the days, like southern, 2,000 years ago, all like sailors and sailing from one coastline sure. to the other. And they were all finally the same big family and with all the same uh, rules, kind of like not pleasant rules, the Vikings. The, you the know, cultural rules. But yeah. cultural and very Celtic. So we all have those kind of uh, famous parties in the summertime when all those sailors are coming together, playing those kind of instruments, kind of like trumpets, you know, but we call that binyu back home, um, and all that kind of special food also, very related to ocean food, like seafruits, uh, the mussels, the oysters, and all, all of that, and all the fish we can have over there too. So yeah, all this is kind of like grouped all together through music too, uh, taste of food, culture, traditions, yeah. dance, yeah. all that is kind of similar. You're making me hungry. This is Jonathan Pajot, uh, Delis Crep in Holly Eva. And if you haven't noticed, he's French. Okay. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour, everybody. Un moment for a break. Uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back after this break here on Think Tech Talks. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. Uh, we're back. We're live. We're here at ThinkTech Talks in the 5 to 6 block. A little, little special, a special show today on Community Matters. Uh, we're calling it the Crepes Revolution with uh, Jonathan Pajot of Delice, which stands for, which means delicious, uh, D-E-L-I-C-E, -E, Delice Crepes which is a, um, a, food, a food truck, as you A were, food truck, correct. In uh, Haleiwa, sure. which is a very famous food truck in Haleiwa. <laughs> Starting a month and a day, today. Okay. And, um, you know, my question to you uh, is, when you, when you left France six years ago, uh, how much experience did you have in making crepes? Six years ago, 33, 26, let's say 11 years of uh, friendly parties making crepes at home. Mm -hmm. but absolutely none uh, professional mm -hmm. um, or commercial cooking experience. Okay, so you made a decision somewhere in there when you got here in between surfing experiences to, that you wanted to go into the crepes business. Tell me about that decision and tell me what you did to implement it, that decision. Well, when I came here six years ago in Hawaii, um, I was missing home a lot. Like when we all like change country, change culture, change life out of 26 years of life somewhere when you go to another place you miss all those 26 years before and food is a way to miss a little less you miss the people you miss the location you miss the nature but food can travel with you a little bit <laughs> so I find my way here uh, how to get the famous buckwheat flour uh, the buckwheat flour is the one we use for the savory crepes again and um, and just the smell of it was like make me fly home. <laughs> so it's pretty easy for me to uh, to not miss home too much by just making those crepes happening. 
and I was just making it once in a while, like once a month, maybe once a week sometime, and just making a party out of it, inviting friends over and saying, guys, let's have a little French party here. This is what we do back home. Very French traditional, Brittany, the crepes, and also the buckwheat flour with the savory crepes, which we, we actually call that galette. Galette's over there. G A L L E T. Uh, G A L E T T E. Okay, galette. galette. It just it's a it's a crepe. It's the same, but with the buckwheat flour. So it's brown crepe, right? And so I was making that, and all my friends were like, "Man, you should open a restaurant. You should do something with that. You, this is good. Uh, we like it. You're having fun doing it. You'll be successful. I mean, you should you should start to do it." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, right. Well." I'm an engineer in environment, I should pursue that. And then I kind of like didn't feel like doing that. I, w I went through like real estate, I went through like tourism, different, uh, different ways, just to like searching a little bit for it. And I was like, well, maybe they were right telling me that all that time. So I'm going to just make it happen and see how it goes. And over the last six months, I've been just pursuing this idea about opening my own crepes uh, business restaurant. So I went back home in France over the summer, and for two months, I worked. Uh, through a French restaurant of mine over there in a beautiful castle in uh, Guérande. Very like where, traditional. Where is Guérande? Guérande is uh, next to Nantes on the Loire River, right next to my hometown where I grew up. It's kind of just on the hill, like five miles behind. And it's extremely beautiful and it's a real castle. And inside that castle, there are the only restaurants that are allowed to be uh, commercial business restaurants are crepes. You cannot open a pizza or you cannot open anything. It must be crepes. And there are 47 of those in one little castle. It's, it's ridiculous, right? And they're all full and they're all doing a little special different here and there. And just people, they come for that. You know, they just don't want to do anything else or try anything else, which is great because this is just very specific, very traditional right there. Yeah. So I was right in the heart of it, uh, learning the really true way to make it for like two months uh, with that great chef who had like 30 years of experience running his restaurant and everything. Yeah. So it was wonderful and I gained a lot of confidence because I used to know how to make them but as a friendly way back home for friends. But I was like if I want to do it as a real business I need to really know what I'm doing, quantities, products, how you manage all that and everything. And through two months I was able to pretty much help him so much that by the end I was running the kitchen with him supervising or not. And I was just taking care of like five big griddles and having like 50 people coming at a time. Because crepes it's a are, big restaurant, huh? Yeah, it's a big restaurant. It's just the, the way crepes are, it's a fresh food that needs to be eaten right now. It's on demand. It's kind of like ice cream. You take the ice cream out of the freezer, you don't wait three hours. And mostly if it's like a real good ice cream that's a custom made or like homemade, you know, whatever. It has to be eaten right away. The crepes is the same. You make the crepe, it takes about two minutes and then you sit and you eat the crepes. It's a, and in 20 minutes you, you should eat it because otherwise the crepe will remain good for like a couple of days, but you will lose all the, the flavors out of it, the texture will change, and all, all, the, all the food, all the essential of the crepes will just go away. So is this a fast turnover in the restaurant? Or do people come, this is, I'm talking about a nuts, uh, um, or, or do they come and they have a crepe, and then later another crepe, and then yeah. later another crepe? Yeah, because they all like, uh, there's so many options in crepes, you can put anything you want in it. So people have fun with that. They come and they're like, oh, me, I'm more on the tomato, mushroom, spinach, great. Oh, me, I'm more on the ham, cheese, egg. Or more on me, like banana, chocolate, whipped cream. Or more on me, like coconut, or whatever. So they have fun. They all sit together and like, I want mine like this, I want mine like that. Usually you start with the savory one. Mm -hmm. you know, it's more proper, right? And okay. we're pretty proper. Appetizer. Appetizers, right? Uh, so you start with the proper uh, savory crepes, and then if you're really hungry, you get another savory crepes, and then you jump to dessert. So if you're like in a crazy hungry mode, you can have two savories and three uh, sweet ones, oh. <laughs> which is fine. It's all healthy. It's all fresh. And it's all relatively light. And yeah. it's all relatively light, right? There's no like big thick uh, sandwiches or the yeah. piece of meat. Everything's kind of thin, yeah. uh, and it's pretty delightful, and everything's good. So it's easy to go through like a couple, yeah. Easily. Okay. So two months, and then you, and this, and this is all in preparation for setting up a business here in Hawaii. Correct, correct. So I did a bit of studying uh, on the market and what I want and where I want to be. I wanted to live on the North Shore for the last pretty much four years. I've been living three years in Honolulu, now it's been three years on the North Shore. I've been living on the North Shore, working in town in Honolulu, and I've been again pursuing everything about the lifestyle, trying to make it uh, wonderful as a living, you know. So um, I was finally able to uh, be able to live on the North Shore and work on the North Shore. And also doing something that's part of my tradition and my origins, making crepes. It's the perfect intersection. 
it's a perfect intersection. I think I might last on this and, uh, and I might like develop it a little bit. And I got really lucky. I found a beautiful van, a minibus that was already customized. I just had to arrange a few things in it to make it like fully legit and good also for my business when I'm making operational wise. Yeah. And uh, and we just uh, we just opened a month uh, a month and one day ago. And when I came back in September, I was looking first for all the administration part, you know, like all the getting the business together, getting the insurance, getting the food permit, of course, and and just getting all that and the financing and everything. And that was the first two months of uh, September, October, November, finding the truck itself, modify, uh, making the modification, getting the food permit and open November 8th. And we just celebrate December 8th yesterday. Our, First month. You've already got a following now in one month. <laughs> yeah, and in one month, and now I got for miles around. <laughs> for miles around, right? The the bus is like from 1973, 73. It has 600,000 miles on the mirror. It's hard to believe, but that's what it's written on the thing. They didn't believe me at the registration uh, the other day. How many miles, sir? 600,000. <laughs> So 1973 was a great year for Volkswagen buses. It was. It was. I recommend 73 for sure. <laughs> like a fine wine, you know. And a fine wine, that's for sure. 73. If you get a bottle of that date, share it with me. <clears throat> but you know what? Uh, looking, looking at that bus, which I did, we have footage of Jonathan in the bus making crepes. He made some crepes for uh, Maria uh, uh, Kishem and me. Yeah. And we really enjoyed that. But we took some footage. And the footage will be on OC16. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll generate some, some unique setup over for sure. See? It's a pretty unique setup. Yeah. Pretty small. You won't fit a big crew in the bus. One, all what? by myself, I'm kind of already taking all the room. Maybe two. But uh, it's a very well organized little um, operation. I could vouch for that. But and, what, uh, what question comes to mind is you, you're tall. How I'm in the six world two. do you get in that bus? I'm 6'2", the bus can fit uh, someone who's 7'2", actually, so there's a good, like, almost foot above my head. Yeah. But you're right, I have to, like, bend a little bit over <laughs> to serve the people. Bend over the hot griddle. Bend over the hot griddle, not burn myself. Well, we call it working also, you know, at some point you just got to do it, what you got to do. And, uh, but I, I really love it. I really love the spirit of the van, making the crepes out of it. Everything's super classy, classical style. Uh, everything's very fresh. I use only like organic local farmers products from uh, Wailua, Haliva, all the, the neighborhood over there. And everything's fresh. We also provide organic and also uh, vegan and vegetarian uh, crepes by using absolutely no egg or milk into the batter, just the, the, the buckwheat flour itself and the water. So we kind of fit into that idea about eating healthy for healthy people. And, you it's know, very important in Haleiwa. People care about that in Haleiwa. Haleiwa, you know? North Shore people, and more and more people care about them about it because uh, some people are really developing serious allergies about gluten from eating kind of too much junk food maybe along the way. Yeah. That the body is just going like, sorry, I can't anymore yeah. eat a tons of bread or pizza or hamburgers or whatever. Yeah. So by giving the gluten-free idea, uh, it's always helpful. And I also find out that it's actually cheaper for me to buy organic healthy tomatoes from my neighbors in Wailua than to buy them at Costco. So at some point you realize that when you search a little bit, you study a little bit your area, it's actually better for a better price. It just takes maybe 10 more minutes. But yeah, sometimes people yeah, have different yeah. priorities and it's all right, you know, we all do different things. <laughs> so if you drive into Haleiwa, you will see Jonathan's uh, bus on the right hand side of the road. How can we best describe where that is? Right across McDonald, right next to Cafe Haliva, right at the entrance of uh, the Haliva town when you're from the mountain side. Yeah, and you're, you're always there in the same place. Every day open, besides today. Today was my first day off. <laughs> because was of this? <laughs> oh, because of my mom, my sister, and my family being here, and oh, I took them okay. around uh, on this side. It was beautiful. But yeah, otherwise, it's really easy to find over there. A very unique uh, little place. I got the old parking place spot, so very visible, easy access. You find me, I'm sure we can find yeah, you again. Yeah, sure. We, we had no trouble finding Jonathan. I will take a short break, Jonathan, and then come back and ask for, for your specific recipe, if you will tell us. I don't know if I can share that. <laughs> okay, nice and your specific cooking technique, if you will tell us, okay? I have no clue. Let's see how far we'll get with that. That's Jonathan Pajot of Delice Crepe in Haleiwa. This is Think Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking Community Matters, the Krebs Revolution. We have a long way to go on this. We'll be right back. We want to thank our underwriters. 
Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashen. See you next time. Okay, we're back, we're live. We're here on Think Tech Talks, Community Matters, with Jonathan Pajot of Delice Crep in Haleiwa, talking about the Kreps Revolution. So let me ask you, you can, you can respond in any way you feel appropriate. What's the special recipe for Kreps? Good. Whatever you do at the end, taste it, try it, eat it. Trial and error. And try, yeah, yeah, try it yourself before. But what are the elements? You know, you're taking the buckwheat flour or the white flour Correct. and you're making a real thin batter out of that. Yeah. Well, a lot of uh, people will measure things. I don't. I just go by texture and look because I guess I know what I'm doing a little bit and I learn over there back home in France and just by the, the liquidity of it, uh, the, the fluid itself. Uh, on the white, on the, the sweet crepes, we used uh, a white flour and a white batter made out of uh, regular flour, the one you buy in any shops, uh, with eggs and milk. And you can add a little bit of salt in it just to make it a little salty, but tiny little bit won't hurt. We have that technique over there back home also that we pour a tiny little bit of beer in it. Kind of a good beer, not a too cheap beer. Uh, that will bring the the fermentation. Mm. It will help the, the batter to fermentate a little quicker and give a little taste to it, but just a little bit beer, right? I don't do I don't put beer. But uh, but I could if I like run out of time because again it will accelerate the fermentation process. Mm -hmm. So for the crepes, the sweet side, white flour, eggs and milk. And the proportion find out on Google. <laughs> it's all over. But is, then is it, you make a big batch in the morning and that lasts you the whole day? The secret, you want to make sure that both of your batters, uh, for the sweet ones with the white flour, egg and milk, or the, the savory ones with the buckwheat we're using, which is a, definitely a better flour, uh, it's also gluten free, you want to make sure that both of those um, batters rest at least six hours. I make them rest, I usually do all of my prepping um, the evening, the day before, for mm -hmm. the next day. Mm -hmm. So you so rest for like 12 them, hours. Do you leave them out during that period or put them in a refrigerator? Refrigerator. Everything has to be in the cold, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you prep everything, you put everything together, both of the batters, and then you leave it in the fridge. Okay. And if you're not too sure if it's still good, just open it and smell. If it smells bad, it's bad. If it smells okay. good, it's good. Okay. So you, all right. Now here you are in the morning after with a 12-hour uh, you know, waiting period, whatever. Um, now you're gonna make a, you can make a crap. How, how do you make the crap? Well, uh, you came uh, to see me over there on the North Shore at Delis Crepes in that little van, so you have that uh, griddle. It's pretty much a, a hot place. It's, it's a perfectly round griddle. Perfectly round uh, griddle, like that table, but just a lot smaller, uh, 14 inches, 40 inches actually, that's the dimensions. And uh, so you pour the, the batter, that's liquid, um, on the griddle, and with a little rack, uh, you pretty much spread a rake, the batter. Like a little rake, like you... That's what it is, I don't have... like a garden tool kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a cooking tool. I don't have the proper term no, in but English. That's what it reminds but, me of, yeah. But that's that's what it is. It's a tiny little rake uh, with a little, that you just pull on it and you spread the batter around. And that's where the technique is uh, important because you don't want to put too much pressure. Otherwise, you will just break the batter and have like gaps in your crepe and mm -hmm. no crepe. No crepe. Or you'd, if you don't put enough pressure, then you end up with something more called a pancake. Which is too, too thick. thick. Too thick. 
So you have to put the right amount of pressure, which is usually none, because the rack itself has a certain weight that will actually do fine. So you just that. pull it, pull it. You have to make sure you cover the griddle in less than 10 seconds, which is not a big amount of time. Because, Why? Because the batter will cook. The griddle is about 400 Fahrenheit, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, in like 200 Celsius, some, somewhere around. So it will cook fast. You will burn yourself if you touch it for sure in, in like a second, and it'll cook real fast. That's a, the process of it. You want like instant cook. So you have to spread the batter uh, in a nice way that's covering the old griddle and with a perfect thin layer. Thin meaning like what, like an inch or so, it's thin. I didn't get a chance to merge that yet. Okay. But, For uh, an engineer, I would have explained. Thin enough. <laughs> okay. Thin enough. Thin enough. There it is. You, you have it here on ThinkTech. The crepe is thin enough. <laughs> it has to be thin. It has to be crispy on the sides around mm -hmm. and still maybe a tiny little doughy in the middle. But okay. you definitely want to reach the crispy side. Okay. How do you know when you've messed it up? Um, there are many ways to know. <laughs> it has to look. This has happened to you, I expect, once in a while. Yeah, well, I've been lucky actually. I haven't messed up so many crepes. Just sometimes it could uh, happen because either the grill is not at the right temperature or the batter has maybe too much water or too much uh, milk or it's too liquid or too solid because sometimes it could vary, vary a little bit. Um, so all that with the, the, the principle of cooking and the heat will not be good. And you could see just the batter will either like, the crepe will like stick to the griddle. That means your griddle is not prep enough. You, you, you could use some... You have to put uh, butter on the griddle before you start. Little butter. What I use is like a, how you call that? Crispy or veg oil. vegetable oil. Yeah, vegetable you know, oil. white white solid oil and you put it on. Yeah. And I use the, the oak of the, um, of the egg. Yes. I break an egg, just the oak, and that crispy oil, and I mix it together, kind of make my own mix. It's kind okay. of like a grandmother little trick. Okay. And I just spread it around. Okay. So you want to add a little layer of uh, grease that's cooked on yeah. it. Yeah. So it won't stick. Yeah, okay. And how, how hot is the griddle? In the 400, like 350, 400 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And so these are, are these special griddles that you have to uh, of course, of order course. from La, La Ball? I got my griddles uh, from a um, place called Quimper, uh, and the brand is Campus. I spell. K-R-A-M-P-O-U-Z. Campus. Campus. It's actually the uh, best tools uh, and griddles around. <laughs> Electric or gas, the one I use out of gas, or just plug the propane and, and burn. But uh, I bought them actually from uh, a distributor in Canada, but they're from an hour away from my hometown in France. That's mm -hmm. where they actually build. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All like 100% French, and it's just, it's a pretty basic tool, and those machines have been around and has been exactly the same concept the way they build for like 50 years, 100 years, I don't know, yeah. like forever. They haven't this changed. is the kinds you saw in France when you were yeah. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. training on, on... Training on, exactly <laughs> the same. Then I decided to go with the gas. Uh, whether I was training, they were electric. But out of a lunch truck for me, and because I'm towards more like the mobile, and some other details so that with the gas, it will heat a lot faster yeah. and cool off a lot faster too. Yeah. So you can uh, handle the, 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 the temperature a lot easier. But it's not as precise. Yeah. It goes up and down faster, but not as precise on the on the heat. On the okay, heat. real quick now, you have to put the uh, the material in, whether it's uh, the, the sweet or the savory. Uh, when do you put it in? You you wait until it browns. I so suppose. we say we add ten seconds to uh, spread the batter to turn liquid into solid, called the crepes, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, then you have another twenty seconds to put whatever you want in it. And then another 20 seconds to let it kind of heat together and mix together. And then in less than a minute, you should take it off because otherwise it's going to be burned. One minute all, all together. It has to be very quick and focused. Yeah. And when you, today in my truck, I have two because there's not much room. Yeah. And two is enough for the business that I'm doing today back home. I learn on five. And believe all when you have the five, same time. if we're like on TV right now, you won't see my hands. It will just go like real yeah, fast. Sounds like great fun, actually. <laughs> it, you don't see the time for sure. You get real like uh, dehydrated. You must drink a lot because there's a lot of heat and you're actually moving fast. I noticed that when you put the, um, you know, whatever it was, the sweet and the savory filling in, in there, you folded it up like a, like a, like a, a yeah. rectangle. Uh, with a sort of tri-corner angle on each side. This is, is that your special technique, or is that always? This the way is it's just done? kind of how I learned. And uh, again, I just make what I learned from the traditional place over there where I'm from. And our savories were always made out of square. Most of our savories, then you can have like special, and you can actually make some art out of it. You can really like build any shapes you want. 
I'm not there yet. I'm just kind of learning every day a little better, a little more. But on savory ones, we make a square out of it. So you can actually see also the, the middle of it, what's inside. It's important to be able to see what and you presentation. eat. And the presentation. And the presentation is everything. As always for food, you know, your eyes will tell you if it's good, sometimes more than your mouth. <laughs> and, um, and then That's for the... That's very French of you. <laughs> no, it's also very true, you know. If, it's all what you see and then what you eat, of course, and what you taste. Yeah. But on, and on the sweet side, uh, we uh, fold them in triangle. So triangle for the sweet uh, and square for the savory. Ah, there's a little okay. difference. Thank right you here. for that. Yeah. So some th that's the way you can tell. This is everybody's convention or just your convention? I'm not too sure. I think um, I would say so far it's my convention here uh, on the island of Hawaii. Back home in France, it's kind of a lot more generalized. That's kind of how we do it. But you will tell also very quickly from a sweet to a savory the color. Sweet is white. Yeah. Savory is brown because of the color of the of the of the batter. Correct. Savory flour. is brown because of buckwheat flour. Yeah. S uh, sweet is white because of just a regular white. And that's flour. the traditional way it's done. Traditional. In the, in the savory, it's buckwheat, and in the sweet, it's always it's the white at flour. least you ask for something different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shifting gears. Okay. So you're you're having a certain amount of success in this, and when, whatever you bring to the table is working, and people are enjoying what you make. I can tell you, I did. I thought it was great. I really, it was a perfect, perfect. <laughs> well, snack I, I did a me. really uh, good job when you were there. <laughs> okay, well, thank best. you for that. <laughs> no, I always do the best. <clears throat> but uh, you know what? I what I want to tap into through you is what I call the food revolution or the crepes revolution, and it's all about young people on trucks um, and buses, <laughs> right, um, right, making food on the highway, first class, you know, first class food, all over Oahu. Um, is this happening elsewhere? I mean, what do you see about this? Are you, are you plugged in to be able to tell me about it? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question because I just got into the food industry five months ago. But just from my experience, I've seen uh, here in Hawaii and also on uh, the California coast, and I kind of heard all, over, all around mainland, so let's call it America, United States, maybe Canada, or maybe maybe also France a little bit, but in the bigger cities. Uh, but it has to be kind of weather-wise. If the weather is doable to make a, a lunch wagon, you know, like warm enough, not raining, not pouring, not Hawaii ice. Hawaii has a long tradition of, uh, of food trucks. And Hawaii has a long tradition of food trucks. It used to be more like the, the famous lunch plate. They call it lunch plate here. Um, but usually it was more like towards the, um, the fish or the local Hawaiian food which I love, and all the poke, everything. On the North Shore, along the coast, they had all those shrimp trucks that have been really successful, very famous. Um, but now we see different type of food coming out, definitely a lot more um, just different from all, all over the world, and uh, Thai food, Vietnamese food, any kind of food, and now we also have like crepes out of, of French food, right? It's casual French food. So um, I think it's just... Um, a way to bring food a little more casual and easy access to people that they don't always want to go to a restaurant and sit and kind of spend the time for that. And the money. And the money too. You're right, in a restaurant it's always more expensive than in a food truck, but those food trucks are not that cheap either. If you go to any food trucks in general, you got to plan at least to spend 10 to 15 to $20, right? Mm, yeah. The crepes, it's a casual, cheap food. Nothing's above $10, at least in my place. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, it's definitely developing because uh, for the, the structure itself, it's just a lot lighter, a lot easier. You don't have to come up with a $100,000 type of capital to invest, and you just come up with a lot lower budget. And there's still some expenses along the way, and risk also, because a food truck, you know, it's not as solid as a, a, sol a bigger business. But, um, but I guess it's happening, right? And definitely, like you were saying, for like younger people, are more into like the food truck, something different and just the diversity out of it I think is definitely very positive brings a lot much bigger diversity and easier access access for the for the little amount of money for people to go eat all that great food and it's kind of a little bit we used to see all those trucks I mean I uh, see back in the days or mostly like here in the United States in the f fairs you know like when they had like those parties and they bring all those kind of different food in a tent well it's kind of like a permanent fair that's what's happening every day now because it's open every day and you get that option and all those different food trucks and you don't have to wait for like a Christmas day or any kind of a special event. 
So well, it reminds what... me of Europe, doesn't it? I mean, with a lot of walking food and, and stands and small shops. And... Small shops, small stands, all very good because you say that now food truck was kind of a connotation or equal to maybe some kind of average type of food. But today you can eat ex excellent food out of a lot of lunch wagon. Everything's fresh, everything's good, everything's just made right here. You can actually see. And, uh, and you actually know what you eat, and that's, I think that's very important. So what's the future for you? We have a few minutes left. Uh, you know, what are your options, and which ones do you think you would migrate to? Well, I just started, and I'm just kind of realizing that this is happening and working. I haven't got a chance yet to breathe and think about <laughs> what the future could be. I'm just going to stick to what I'm doing right now, doing it good, doing consistent, everyday quality and just having people coming to my place and being happier than they were before and just sharing the hello house we say here and, and by providing the, the, the good crepes and the healthy food for healthy people here on the North Shore and here in Hawaii and all over and maybe, I don't know, maybe if tomorrow I'll have another truck or not. It's not my idea to become like a great uh, corporation, you know, I'm kind of fine where I'm at and, um, and if I can just bring more, um, more people to, to my place and, and expand a little bit the food, I uh, will certainly do, yeah. Yeah, so, what, so I mean, one possibility is to have more trucks, another possibility is to have larger trucks, I mean, because right now the bus is not very big. Yeah. Uh, and maybe taller, too. But <laughs> taller, wider, <laughs> and not a mini bus, yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, I just wonder about the possibility, for example, of you going into uh, an eat the street kind of uh, format. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what its future is, but it's a really great idea. It's a wonderful idea. No, you're right. Is the street has been a great success. I know a lot of them. I've been there myself, just as a customer, and I love those those moments over there because it's the street. There's all the food, but also all the art that goes around and kind of the, the, the great dynamic. And it's it's a party itself. You just don't go get a meal. You go you go party pretty much. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And for me, just a little on the other side of the island, I'm kind of fine where I'm at over there in Haliva on the North Shore, I'd be completely very happy also to try hit the street and all of those great events that are in town. Um, I don't know yet, I'm just kind of uh, finding out a little bit what are my options along the way. And again, I'm just really also happy with what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the, the lunch wagon that I have as a minibus can drive real well, besides the 600,000 miles on the, on the meter. Um, but, or get, um, get, or get, get your organic uh, vegetables and so forth. <laughs> exactly. Taking the great food from the North Shore to town, that's, that's definitely yeah, an option. Yeah. But you know, it strikes me that uh, you know, there are a number, probably a growing number of food trucks in that area. It's, it's, it's just a perfect area for that. People care about it. Right. It's a tourist area. It's a local area where people like, uh, you know, fresh food and lo local food. And if uh, her, her name is uh, uh, Pony Askew, who runs, uh, uh, if you want, I can introduce you, uh, the Eat the Street program. Okay. And uh, why not have an Eat the Street program in the North Shore, don't you think? With a lot of these food trucks like yours, all yeah, together, yeah, yeah. all one together, place, coming together, That's so a... that everyone knows where to go. Right, right, right. We could definitely like bring the eat the street concept to the North Shore, and uh, and gather all those trucks and make some great events and bring a great diversity of food uh, once in a while. Wouldn't I that think. be something? Yeah. That would be that would be actually a good idea. Yeah, yeah. The other thought I had for you is uh, is the restaurant. I mentioned that uh, you know in our little survey of Crips, which is what we're right. engaged in for. OC16 program uh, is, uh, you know, we found that the Crips restaurants actually have been pretty successful. And, and you've been successful. You're in the black, right? Right, right. You're right. living on it, right? Yeah, no, that's my living today. I'm, yeah, I'm doing it yeah. every day from uh, 9 yeah. to 8, so yeah, yeah. I have no time to do much other things besides surfing before. But, you know, these restaurants have been successful. Well, yeah. The one, the one I'm thinking of right now, which is. Uh, uh, Krebs no Kaoi in Kailua in is actually Kailua. moving into a larger space, a significantly larger space, probably twice the space. They already have a pretty substantial restaurant. They're going double, <clears throat> you know, right down a block. And, uh, you know, Kailua swears by this place. So all I'm saying is it's a, it's a taste whose time has come. Right. People are, you know, they're going French. What can I say? <laughs> they're going French and they're going for the, the great fresh food, easy food. It, Crepes is kind of like candy a little bit. You can make your own, and it's kind of like a little party meal. You know, it's not th something too official, and uh, and it's a fun meal. You know, when you're gonna eat crepes, that you're gonna have a good time, and I think people are definitely for that. So, is that in the future for you, a restaurant? I think so, definitely down the road. I definitely see myself putting that beautiful little uh, VW minibus inside 
a box and that box we call the restaurant and it'll be the kitchen out of the mini bus keeping that forever because I think it's just a beautiful little piece and having a bigger place that I can just invite all of my friends. And by that time it'll be 800,000 miles on the bus. It's very possible. <laughs> Great. Well, okay, that's Jonathan Pajot, uh, Delise Crepe in Haleiwa. And here on Think Tech Talks, we've been talking about the Krebs Revolution, uh, Community Matters. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you very much. It's been great to have you on the show. Aloha. I wish you well in all regards. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Aloha. Aloha.